Hello, welcome to the Ghosts of Harrenhal. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 102 of our chapter-by-chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. Today we'll be discussing chapter 28 of A Clash of Kings. That's Bran 4. By the way, did you notice, I I don't know if you noticed the English-American difference in that. I did not. Did you hear it? No. It's it's the episode number. How would you say the episode number? One hundred and two or one oh two? You said one hundred two. I said one hundred and two. Oh uh-huh. that's that's how British people would say that. And the very first time I wrote a check in the United States, the woman was familiar with British people and she said, Don't write the ant. <laughs> <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> <laughs> you live and learn. <laughs> Whew, good thing she was there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, uh, obviously no one would have cashed a check that said $102. Right. It would be like, what is this and doing in here? Exactly. I'll give you $100, I'll give you $2, but what this and is, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> well, what we're going to do is we're going to chat about the chapter and try not to spoil any future plot points for you. And hopefully we're going to provide you some entertainment along the way. We'll summarise what happened, discuss our thoughts on it, provide some useful background, compare it to the television show, indulge in a little pedantry, and cover some relevant news and listener correspondence. Be sure to check out the show notes. They provide some additional information about the characters and places in the chapter, particularly useful if you're not reading along. How are you this morning, McKelly? I'm doing just fine. How about you? I have nothing to complain about. I have a new board game, as you know. I do. <laughs> that was funny how that worked out. <laughs> that was funny because um, so there's a bulletin board at work where people sell things. Like a virtual a, bulletin board. A virtual bulletin board. And a guy posted that he had a board game for sale and I was very interested. Um, and McKelly, being a thoughtful friend, saw the board game on the bulletin board and emailed me and said, have you seen this? And... Um, I replied with a picture of me holding the board game because I'd already reached out to the guy, bought it, gone to his house, got it, and come home and was reading the rule book by the time McKelly noticed it. A little slow, but, uh, you know, the intentions. It was like lunchtime. I just, like, I got so excited when I saw this board game. I was like, that's it. Cancel my day. 7 a.m., you're knocking on his door. (laughs) Open up, open up. (laughs) Uh, for, yes. for those who are interested, it's it's uh, Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, which, uh, according to Board Game Geek, or The Geek, to those oh. in the know, um, <laughs> it's the number six board game of all time. Wow, that guy, he, he, you got it for a pretty good price too, right? Mm-hmm. Well, it, it's not terribly expensive. I mean, it's, it's, its list price is about $40, but I got it for $20, and he'd only played it twice. So essentially, it was pristine. So wow. I was very happy, very happy. Okay. And, and not only that, he he didn't take Venmo, which is the American way of paying for things these days. So he said, uh, cash or PayPal. And I was like, oh, OK, well, I'll find a way. And I checked in my wallet and I found a $20 bill it that has been fate. there for at least 18 months. I mean, I you know, <laughs> I'm not, I haven't played for anything in cash in years. And I was like, OK. <laughs> so, so essentially to me, it was free. I was just right. giving away a piece of paper that I didn't even know I had. So. <laughs> wow. Yes, it was destiny. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's very good. It's yeah. very good. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll play it sometime. You, you, All you'll, right. I think you'll like it. Okay. I think I'll... I think your wife will disparage us while we play. <laughs> if we do it here, if we do it there, I, I don't know if Carson will, will uh, react the same way. <laughs> Carson's played it and she liked it more than she thought she would. Oh, okay. I'll take that. Yeah, that is definitely a, m- many steps further than how Stacy would react. <laughs> is it the kind of game that I like where everyone works together or is it the contentious kind where everyone works Against each yes, other. Yes, yes, you kind-hearted soul. It is indeed a cooperative game. Good. I mean, unless, <laughs> unless you're lumping in the monsters with us, because <laughs> we, we, we are not working with those guys. Right. That's good. Those are, those are the only uh, kind of board games I can really get into, is one where uh-huh. everybody's working together. Mm-hmm. So that's just, that, that fits my personality better. It is your personality right there. 
We should get down to business. We How do should. we leave Bran Stark, Prince Bran Stark? Last we saw him, he was hosting the Lords and Ladies of the North at a harvest feast in Winterfell's Great Hall. The festivities were interrupted by the arrival of Mira and Jojen Reed from Grey Water Watch in the Neck. That night, as Bran slept, he dreamt he was Summer in the Godswood. In the dream, Summer or Bran were visited by the Reed siblings. When Jojen touched Summer, Bran dropped out of Summer's body and began to fall. Michele, why don't we give them the summary of this one? Okay. Bran and the Reeds are once again in the Godswood, although this time in the Waking World. Mira is sparring with Summer while Bran and Jojen spectate. Summer dives at Mira, landing on top of her. Bran thinks it's a victory for Summer. However, Jojen points out it's actually a loss. Mira has snared Summer in her net. It's all in good fun, though, and when Mira frees Summer from the net, he playfully carries Bran around before settling down and putting his head in the boy's lap. You know, I, we read this chapter a bunch of times, and we write all these notes, and we read all these notes. It's just occurred to me that Summer could still have killed Mira. I mean, he couldn't bite his way through the net, but he's, sitting, he's on top of her with his wolf-like claws. Yes. Simply right. extending them would have been... I, at best, it's a draw, and I would say that probably <laughs> the wolf still won. Yeah, good point, good point, yeah. It seems the rest of the highborn guests left soon after the harvest feast ended. However, the reeds have stayed on and become Bran's closest companions, causing Bran to wish they were the Stark's wards instead of the Walder's fray. Mira tells Bran about Greywater Watch always being on the move, and Bran would love to visit and see a floating castle. When Mira says he'd be welcome now, if he'd like, Bran thinks on the possibility his best bet for success would be to ask Sir Roderick, as Maester Lurin would never allow it, but Winterfell's castellan has been ridden east to deal with an issue. Seems that Roose Bolton's bastard accosted Lady Donella Hornwood as she returned to Hornwood Castle from the harvest at Winterfell. He then proceeded to marry her pretty much on the spot. When Lord Wyman Manderley got wind of the transgression, he took control of Hornwood Castle to protect the lands from falling into the clutches of the Boltons. Roderick rode out to set things to rights. While Bran is thinking on this, though, Jojen jumps in and tells Bran it would be a good idea to get out of Winterfell soon. Bran wonders why Jojen is so adamant. Mira reveals that Jojen has the green sight. He dreams of things that sometimes come to pass. Jojen contends that they always come true. Bran wants to know what Jojen dreams of, but Jojen wants to hear about Dr Bran's dreams as payment. Bran is sensitive by his dreams, in denial even, and as Jojen presses Bran... Bran gets angry, which manifests itself as Summer getting angry with the reeds. Mira has them hop into a tree just as Shaggy Dog arrives, bared to, teeth bared, to join in the mayhem. The reeds are stuck in the tree, as the wolves are refusing to comply with Bran's demands. But Hodor comes over, and he's able to chase the wolves away. Bran wants away from the reeds, and has Hodor take him to Lewin. With the maester, he learns more about Greensight. The first men cut down the werewoods, as they believed the Greenseers saw through the carved eyes. The Greenseers were also said to have control over animals. Bran compares it to him and Rickon's dream of their father's death. Lewin shows Bran his chain and points out the Valyrian steel link for the study of magic. He describes that if magic was a powerful force in the realm, it is no longer. The fall of Valyria was the last embers dying. Dragons, giants, the children of the forest are all gone. Lewin concludes that Jojen is full of it. Later, Bran talks to Mira again. He apologises for Summer, but argues that Jojen shouldn't have badgered him. In Bran's opinion, the dream crow lies, and so does Jojen. Mira suggests that perhaps Lewin is wrong. Bran gets upset again. Mira describes another of Jojen's dreams involving Maester Lewin. This dream also troubles Bran, but Lewin's logic and dispassion rob Bran of one of his hopes. If magic were real, maybe he could be whole again, or even more. So, one thing we did this week, I, I don't know if you realise this, but I intentionally left out the sort of, like, the content of the two dream discussions. I mean, because I thought that they were better in discussions, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just said that. Bran and Jojen got into it over Bran's dreams, but they right. actually there were very specific points that they raised. So we'll we'll, we'll get into that in discussion. Similarly, the, the uh, dream that Mira describes to uh, Bran right at the end there, um, yeah, is quite specific. Makes sense to me. 
a mosquito just flew past. So if you hear any, if you hear any random slaps on the uh, <laughs> audio, that's, that's me attacking this mosquito. So one thing I'll say, it's great that Bran has some real friends. I mean, I think they treat him kindly, but not with pity. And it feels like there's kind of the antidote to what the Walders are like. Yes, absolutely. He certainly doesn't seem to jive very well with the Walders' fray. So it's good. Yeah. Now, they're, the Reeds are both older than him. Mira's, um, what, seven years? She's 16 and Bran's nine, so she's seven years older. One of the things I notice is that they're, they're playing with him as they would anyone, any kid. You know, it's, right. it's not like they're treating him differently because he's handicapped. You know, he is, yeah, yeah. he's out there with them and they're having fun and games with him. And I think it's bringing him out of his shell. I mean, him getting dragged along by Summer was kind of like a, a sight that you could imagine he would be sensitive about letting people see if he wasn't close with them. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. It's You're right. The, the contrast between when the Walters were playing in the Godswood and pretty much played something that he couldn't be involved in versus yeah. here where they're including him. O- other than as a dungeon master, which he didn't actually enjoy that much. Right. Yes. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Uh, so one thing I, I read online about was, um, so Howlin' Reed has a moving castle. And there's a, a movie and a book called Howl's Moving Castle. Now, the book came out, or the movie came out in 2004. The book, however, came out in 1986. So this book, Clash of Kings, came out in 98. So it's possible that it could have been the influence for this Howlin' Reed having a moving castle thing by Martin. Oh, I, I will say, McKelly. That, you know, we've talked before about how, you know, we spend quite a lot of time preparing all this, you know, re- reading over the chapter, writing these notes, reading over the notes to make sure we understand them all. I think about probably north of 40% of my time is trying to interpret your gibberish. <laughs> In the notes. <laughs> it's just a series of like, be- it's like R2-D2 wrote it. <laughs> I mean, read this next sentence. Insight into GWW, BG, and pedantry. I'm like, what does any of this mean? I, I figured out Greywater Watch. Yep. GWW is Greywater Watch. But BG is background? Yes. So we get some... Oh. <laughs> what it means is we got some insight in this chapter into Greywater Watch. But we'd also provided some info on Greywater Watch in the background section of a previous chapter and right. we've also discussed right. it in penetry because she mentions ravens can't get to uh he says who takes she says i haven't we have no maester there and brand says well how who handles your ravens and she says ravens can get to gray water watch no better than our foes can and i had mentioned in penetry uh previous brand chapter that he says that uh, her his father used to send messages to Greywater Watch, and I questioned how he managed to do that if nobody yes. can find it. So yes. that's what that was in reference to. Yes, okay. That's good. I I, I brought it up for the laugh, really. Just <laughs> That particular one tripped me up for several minutes. I was like, what is he uh, talking about? Well, what I have an issue with is when I have too much text, I can't digest it in my head fast enough yeah. while I'm also talking about current things. So It's interesting because maybe we need our own notes because I'm the opposite, you see. I, I, I get tripped up not by having lots of text to read but by having to interpret. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do that to you. <laughs> if you... I, I still think, I mean, just coming back to that, I mean, I know it's a point we, we belabored a little bit, but I mean, they must put people on the road. I mean, because where they are, this it's in the neck, right? Where there's basically right. just the King's Road is the only way through the neck. Right. So they must put spies on there looking for messengers, right? I yes. I guess. That was, that was my uh, joke, is that they must have a P.O. box somewhere. Right. <laughs> so they must have someone manning the P.O. box somewhere on the King's Road. <laughs> we'll be right back. Hello, friends. Are you ready to make some unforgettable memories? Well, if so, consider the Marriott Bonvoy program. Discover the perfect destination for your summer getaway and unlock exclusive deals on luxurious accommodations. With our affiliate partnership, you'll enjoy unbeatable savings and a seamless booking experience. Don't let summer slip away. Visit Marriott Bonvoy today and make this vacation season one for the books. 
Use our Ghosts of Heron Hall affiliate page to check it all out and buy Bonvoy points or give some as a gift. The link to our page is in the show notes. But, but that person, of course, would know where the castle is. So all you have to do is right. get that one and torture them. <laughs> it's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe they do it like um, you know, like some organized crime situations do, where that person only knows how to get to the next to the leg. next oh. person. Right, <laughs> yes. right, right, right. No, that makes perfect sense. I, I was thinking the same thing actually. <laughs> you could even that that person could actually just have like l- like a little ravens. Uh, Sort of like a wooden structure for ravens, just sitting right. there, and that's where you send the ravens <laughs> yes. to there. And from there, they pass it on by word of mouth through this chain gang of uh, "I only know where the next guy is." Right, that's how they do it. It's got to be. But yeah, like I said, Mira mentions they they have no maester at Greywater Watch. They have no knights, no master at arms, uh, which is very different from the rest of the realm, except for maybe in the. Uh, Mountains of the Moon, some of the mountain clans, maybe in the Mountains of the Moon and the Northern Mountain clans. And uh, yeah, she but, mentioned but I mean, that. Her... Anyone who's within the sort of like the confines of the social structure of Westeros has a maester. Yes. I mean, the, the, the clans, sure, they don't, but they're not really within the social structure of, of the place. Exactly. So it is it is unique, basically. I will say, actually, just, just sort of like just presaging a little bit of what we're going to talk about. You, your mention of the fact that they don't have a maester goes to sort of like the heart of your interpretation of this whole chapter. Your interpretation of this whole chapter is that the the what's holding Bran back is his training, is his knowledge, is his learning from Maester Lewin. Yes, right. That that uh, because Jojen and Mira don't have Maesters, they have a more open mind to certain things. And um, I have to say, I didn't think about that until your notes, until you started to write your notes. I was like... <laughs> That is actually what George Martin was getting at. That is precisely what he was getting at. Because when we get to the specific bit, I'll mention what I thought he meant. Oh, okay. Um, but, but but I I defer to you. I think you were right on this. I'm heartened that you were able to tra- uh, translate my gibberish well enough to pick up on the <laughs> sentiment of these notes. <laughs> I, I do. I do. I can often infer the sentiment. It's just, just the specifics are often lost on me. <laughs> so the reason invite Brand to visit Greywater Watch. And Bran thinks, you know, it'd be nice to do that one day. But they, they mean right here, right now. Right, let's, let's go. <laughs> let's go. Um, and Jojen, who later, you know, in a, in a few minutes in the chapter, we discover has green sight, says, it would be good if you left Winterfell sooner rather than later. And it's like, okay, so what do you know? You know, what have right. you seen? Yes, yeah. And Bran asks, what's going to happen? And he says... Uh, let's talk about your dreams first. Then right, I'll... right. Yeah. <laughs> but... You see, and 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 that's that's funny you mentioned that actually because I forgot. I mean, I I remember that that conversation was had, but I forgot that Bran never got the other side of the bargain because Bran balks at sharing his dream. He doesn't get right. the other side of the bargain, so we never do learn what Jojen knew, what what Jojen knows. Right. Only only the dream about the crow and or the wolf winged wolf in chains, which I guess will. Get right, to but, in but a the minute. but the wing yes, the, the 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 dream that he does describe to Bran is not a reason to get out of Winterfell necessarily. Right. Yeah. Um. Right. It wouldn't be, except for I guess, unless you're doing the crow's bidding, and the crow says, "I need those chains broken so that he yeah. can open his third eye." Yeah. But 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 the other thing that you mentioned was that we know the Ironborn are coming. We know that the right. Ironborn have their sights on the north. And so maybe that's what Jojen has seen. You know, an attack on Winterfell, it would be better if Bran was not here for. Yes, um, exactly. But I do think, I mean, Bran knows that Maester Lewin would say no. He thinks there's a chance Sir Roderick would say yes, but he's not around to say yes. But um, it is pretty unlikely because there always has to be a Stark in Winterfell. That's right. practically their words. If winter was not coming, there would always <laughs> have to be a Stark in Winterfell. And that yeah. would only that and Bran is the last Stark in Winterfell. Oh wait, hang on. Oh, Rick, <laughs> Rickon would then really be the last Stark in Winterfell. So. <laughs> Could you imagine four-year-old Rickon being the Stark in Winterfell, the the prince? <laughs> Shaggy uh, dog just prowling around everywhere, biting right. whatever he sees. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, so, yeah, it does so, seem unlikely. I mean, that you think the only way there wouldn't be a Stark in Winterfell is if there was some serious 
crisis occurred. Right. But we'll, we'll, we'll get into Jojen's um, green dream in a moment. But but first, it's it's kind of Bran's thought process when he's thinking about, oh, I'd like to do that. I'd like to go to Greywater Watch, but I can't because Maester Lewin's going to say no. And I can't ask Sir Roderick, who might possibly say yes, because Sir Roderick is away. And then he thinks quickly about what Sir Roderick is up to. And uh, what he's done is he's rode east toward Hornwood dreadfort uh area because like we said in the summary Bruce Bolton's bastard is kidnapped and married Danella Hornwood now we get a lot of names and a lot of people doing a lot of things in this book and if it's your first time through you might be like who are these people again and what are they doing so just a <laughs> or you're me <laughs> <laughs> just a, a quick recap on what's happening here so Danella Hornwood was the newly widowed wife of Hallis Hornwood, who died in the battle on the Green Fork, and her son Darren was killed at the Whispering Wood. So we now have no male heir in Hornwood, and in a few brand chapters ago, we saw every single, every lord who was single throw their hat in the ring as her suitor, and those who were married offered sons and other alternatives to get their grips into uh the the now very consumable hornwood lands and of course wyman manderley offered either himself or a son either way either one is fine and uh, another thing that uh plays into how all this worked out the way it did is that Danella came to winterfell for the feast with only six men at arms not a big retinue of knights or anything just six men at arms so you could see why they'd be easily overtaken by the uh bolton men and she herself reported that she was troubled by what bruce bolton's bastard was doing i I, I, we know what this kid's first name given name is don't we but it hasn't been mentioned in the book yet so it's correct i I, keep referring to him as bruce bolton's bastard but yes um, i i checked that I did a search in my ebook, and yes, there's been no mention of his first name yet. So that's yeah. why I just keep calling him that because yeah. um, he's been amassing men at Redfort, and he, she, she doesn't like the Boltons. She's a little bit afraid of them. And um, Donella asked him why he was amassing men, and he said that Boltons don't answer to women. So this kind of re- reaffirmed that he was not someone she wanted to. Uh, have truck with now she's married to him luckily for her um <laughs> she also claimed that he the, the bastard and his servant reek hunt together and not for deer so um she won't be very happy with the situation she finds herself in i think we can safely assume i don't right. think she would be happy to marry anyone but i think of all of the suitors she would be least pleased to be married to this one yes i think you're right on that assumption she mentioned in when she first got to winterfell that uh, that Bruce Bolton's son or bastard son uh, said she said that he looks hungrily at her lands now that her husband is husband and son are both gone. To be fair, all the lords of the north are looking yes. hungrily, hungrily <laughs> at her lands. He's not but alone. <laughs> it, it seems Bruce Bolton's <laughs> bastard is the one who's most uh, sinister about it. Yes. Now, of course, the Hornwoods and the Boltons are neighbors, so. Assuming the Hornwood lands would significantly increase the Bolton holdings, near just about double them, really. And that, of course, would certainly rankle Wyman Manderley, as their lands would be more of a threat to his domain, which is the largest domain domain out east. Uh, so Wyman's rationale, if you want to defend Wyman, is that the Hornwood lands are basically within the greater Manderley lands. They actually fit more nicely into that um they sit on the northwest edge, the Hornwoods land, sit on the northwest edge of Sheep's Head Hills, which are basically within the Mandalay's domain. So, and and Donella was a Mandalay by birth. She's a cousin to Wyman. So she probably, she doesn't want to marry anyone, but she probably would be happier uh, marrying back into her own family. Although she might be, but she she says she's past childbearing age anyway, doesn't she? So it's, Yes, right. Yeah, so, so it's not a great time for Roderick to leave because no. we know that the Ironborn, the Ironborn are planning to come. So uh, another problem for the North here. Yes, the 
Balon mentioned that they expect to lay siege to Winterfell. So yeah. now the Castellan of Winterfell is on the wrong side of the kingdom from where the Ironborn will be attacking. And uh, that could be especially problematic if he doesn't get back in time to prepare the castle for a siege. And it's also problematic because we know that they plan to hit Deepwood Mott, uh, the Glover's castle, which is on the western side. That's where um, Asha's force is going to attack first, as well as Moat Kalen. So he's he, he couldn't be in a much worse position to get news quickly of uh, yeah. either of those two events taking place. I do, I do wonder, though, Winterfell is pretty large, and the one thing that Ironborn don't have is a lot of men. It would be hard to make a encircling siege of, for them for them to make an encircling siege of Winterfell that couldn't be penetrated. Yeah, it feels like Sir Roderick could slip back into Winterfell and sort of if they can hold out without him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so. That goes along with my point of they just the Ironborn just don't have enough men to take over the North like they right. plan right. to do. <laughs> Now, this is a little bit uh, just conspiracy theory, basically. But you which, know, which as, as you see, I've added a note to contend your conspiracy theory. Oh, uh, okay. So, so you you go ahead, and then then I will knock down your house of cards. Right. We'll be right back. This episode is sponsored by Audible. To get a free audiobook or two, if you're an Amazon Prime member, go to our exclusive URL audibletrial.com slash ghosts Hall. You can find the link in our show notes. Um, so we've been critical of Roos Bolton for needlessly sending those foot soldiers into battle with Tywin's army at the battle on the Green Fork. And we were like, that was not necessary. Your Your job there was to keep the... Lannister forces moving north and keep them away from the crossing um, of the Green Fork down by the Inneth Crossroads. And we were like, why would you just sacrifice all those men? And and I thought about, about what his bastard son has done here and the needlessness of that particular sacrificing of men. And I wondered if there might have been some possible intention there. Maybe his intention was to kill off a lot of the competition, including Hallis Hornwood, in an attempt to increase his power and position in the North, basically, is my conspiracy theory here. Uh, but, but actually, there's a second part to it. To there talk is, about yes. that too. It's possible. I want to bring it all down. I want you to build up the whole <laughs> edifice before I, before I wrecking ball it. My, my other thought was, possibly he told his son that when word comes of Hallis Hornwood's death, to make a move on his lands. Now he couldn't have known that Darren Hornwood would die because he wasn't in his group. He was Darren was in Rob's group, but you know, all right. Okay. I'm already making up holes in my own plan, in my own theory here. <laughs> yeah. So I, I question this just to sort of like on a fundamental level. I mean, first of all, I don't think it's Bruce Bolton's plan. I think it's Rob Stark's plan. That Bruce Bolton is following. I, now, I think that tactically, I think he could have. Harried T- Tyrion's, sorry, Tywin's army, and then backed off. Harried, backed off, rather right. than engaging them in battle. But, but hey, you know, if you the, the 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 plot of land that they were fighting on was sufficiently narrow that Tywin's larger force wasn't overwhelming to him. I mean, it was like it was like a ten to one disadvantage. But the the width of the land was such that they were basically able to fill their front. So basically, you're going to lose. But you're also going to take as as big a chunk out of that army as you possibly could with your force. So he just decided, let's get this over with in one fell swoop. It was Rob's plan, not Roose Bolton's. But the other thing I would say is that Roose Bolton has, although he's scary, there's no question about it, he scares Catelyn, he scares me. <laughs> uh, he's been loyal to a fault. And this move you're describing is a significantly disloyal act at a very sensitive moment. My interpretation of all this is that the bastard son has become drunk on power, having been left in charge. I mean, it, he is he is an illegitimate child. He has no expectations of inheriting, or had no expectations of inheriting uh, the Bolton lands. But right. now he's been left in charge, 
and he's got drunk on the power and is just a loose cannon doing whatever he wants. He yeah. hunt he hunts humans apparently. You know, at least not just deer. <laughs> not just deer. I mean, yes, it doesn't say what it is, but I mean, it <laughs> right. seems like it's humans that he hunts. It does. Uh, and... It's definitely inferred. Now, I will say that marrying uh, Danella Hornwood is a surprisingly strategic move of someone who's just a loose cannon drunk on power. So that does right. give some credence to what you're saying. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't know Roos well enough yet to know. Uh, what if he would be up for something like what I'm proposing? But you're right. So far, we don't have any reason to doubt him. So yeah. Um, one thing: Roos is not married at the moment, is he? No, he not is... at the moment. Right. So, so if this was Roos's plan, he, he might want himself to marry Danella Hornwood rather than his True. son. Yes. Good point. Although, so... if he. So you're thinking legitimately, like get permission from Rob, not do the pull the move like what his son just did. Right. Yeah. He's of an age with her. Their lands are next to each other. It's a perfectly reasonable pitch. But if the bastard becomes legitimized and is the heir to the Bolton lands, he needs to marry someone of uh, childbearing age. Good point. <laughs> it's, the line will end quickly otherwise. Right. <laughs> So anyway, back to back to the uh, the weirwoods, and uh, Mira tells Bram that her brother has the green sight that she that uh, he dreams things that haven't happened, but sometimes they do. And this <laughs> there's an interesting moment here when Jojen bridles, and he said, "There is no sometimes." Yes, and a look passes between them, and there's a very interesting word choice here, I think, because he says that the look passes between them. Jojen is sad, and Mira is defiant. But my yep. thinking is, if if I'm someone who has dreams that I think always come true, and someone says they sometimes come true, the look I would have would be the defiant look. Yes. That Jojen would be the defiant one, and Mira would be the sad one. You know, Mira's sad either for the fact that her brother is utterly delusional, <laughs> or sad for the fact that she knows some horrible dreams he's had that might come true, because he's so convinced they all come true. Right. But, but it's the other way around. It's it's her being defiant and him being sad. Yes, I hadn't thought about that word choice, but yeah, that's a solid point. Which even further ties this interaction back to what I propose here, that it's possibly related to his this is not the day I die man. You You are absolutely right. That's why she's defiant, I think, because I think he says that line quite often. She reacts to that line like he's she's heard it before. He's right. dreamt of his death and therefore finds feels himself in, invulnerable to anything. Right. And that gets her annoyed and she's obviously she obviously pulls him out of danger over and over again because he doesn't bother to get himself out of danger. And <laughs> that's where today. her defiance <laughs> is coming from. Yeah. Not today because you're gonna grab me by the scruff of the neck and pull me out of the way of that oncoming <laughs> bus. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I think she's holding out hope that maybe this dream is wrong. And this is The not, dream of his death. The dream of his death will be wrong. We and don't know what that is. I mean, it could be like, you know, 94 years old in bed with two beautiful young ladies, you know. Well, one thing's for sure is his dream of his death must include Mira. And they must have all their limbs. There must be two sets of arms and two sets of legs. Because uh, twice now, he's been unafraid of a snarling dire wolf snapping at him <laughs> and Mira and be like, no, nope, don't worry, there's nothing to fear here. So clearly he's seen in his death that they all have their arms and legs and are together. <laughs> that would be funny if, if it cuts to the dream of his death and he's like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so it was um, uh Acting out a heart attack there while counting his fingers and toes. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I forget we're not on video all the time now. Now we've done it once. Now that we've done it once, it just feels like an uh, old hat. But, you know, thinking about something that Bran mentions that old Nan thinks about him. He, he mentions that uh, Jojen is so somber that Nan calls him little grandfather. And 
if you take it that we're correct and that he has uh, dreamed his death and has accepted, knows the way and timing of his death, you know, that would that would certainly cause someone to be more solemn in nature. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's one of the reasons why kids are so spirited and optimistic is they, they for the most part, don't fully grasp that they will die. It's, you know, it, it's not until you reach a certain age that you kind of grapple with your mortality and accept that, oh, yeah, right, right, we all die, including me. Oh, so not ready, for, not ready for this, McKelly. I know it's not got, even nine thirty. My, my optimistic nature, my, 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 I'm so spirited now. I'm starting to think about the icy fingers. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So the, I was just thinking about why he is as somber as he is, and I guess if you had this, the not even just this knowledge, he's clearly seen other sad, traumatic things, oh, like possibly yeah. something that might happen his to Brandon. family's death yeah Brandon, right. yeah all of these things yeah. so that would certainly cause you to be uh, a little somber and solemn in nature yeah but uh, one thing they didn't do was um martin didn't hide the foreshadowing of this green site uh, very deeply because in the in the introduction to him back at the feast in the great hall it's mentioned that he's dressed all in green from his, you know, from his boots all the way up, all in green, including his eyes. His eyes are like moss-colored green. Now, the only thing that's not green on him is his teeth, which is what the Walters said he would have green because he eats frogs. Right. So, right. you know, they he certainly uh, gave us a little little nugget that this there might be something green yeah. involved with Jojo. Well, here. you know, when you feel you've got the green side, you you, you want to lay, you know, wear it like <laughs> right. a superpower. You know? I guess so. <laughs> so. Jojen and Bran have this back and forth, and, and in it, Jojen describes one of the dreams that he's had. Not the dream he promises to share with Bran if Bran will describe his own dreams, but, but a dream that he's had about Bran. And the dream basically consists of a winged wolf bound to the earth by grey stone chains. There's a crow that can't peck through the chains. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously the winged wolf feels like Bran. Bran's been told to fly on multiple occasions. Right. Um, he is obviously a wolf child in some ways. And he is obviously pinned to the ground by chains, you know, obviously metaphorical, but I mean, also to a certain extent literal because he can't walk anymore. You know, he is... Right. He's confined to Winterfell, which is a stone castle. Right, right. Um, and the crow not able to peck through the chains is, is, is kind of like the crow's leading him in the dreams but can't do it for him. He has to break these chains himself. Right. Yes. He's trying in the state the chains are just too strong. And this is where what well, this is where we get to what we were discussing earlier. That um my my interpretation of the chapter was that his instruction and influence from Lewin, grounding him in facts and accepted knowledge is is one of the things that is holding him down, holding him back from flying and opening that third eye. Yeah. And of course, yeah. as your green dream suggested, the Citadel <laughs> doesn't want the idea of magic gaining favor, possibly, because they want to control the, the uh, thoughts and prevailing ideas in the kingdoms. I will say, though, that Lewin... When Lewin's describing his Valyrian uh, link of his chain, he clearly gave it his best shot. It's not like it's not like he went into the study of magic to disprove magic. He went into right. the study of magic to try to learn magic and failed as everyone has before. Yes, because they feel that magic is dead. So that's. I mean, that's to their credit. If if they're being honest about it, or I mean. Maybe it's not even dishonesty. Maybe it is they they really are trying and they really are failing because other aspects of their learning are shackling them from right. opening right, up right, their yeah. own third eye, you know. Solid point. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, him discounting magic because he wasn't able to do it or anyone he knew wasn't able to do it doesn't allow for the fact that there might be people who 
have the special ability to do it. Right. So. And that would fly in the face of what the Maesters believe. Because the Maesters, being men of science, believe that you can learn everything. Right. You know? Yeah. Talent is useful, but hard work and learning are all that's needed to, to, to do anything. Yeah. And if, obviously, if, people, if certain people are magic, that flies in the face of that principle. Right. Uh, so one of the things Bran, so when he tells, Jojen tells Bran about the the crow pecking at the chains of the winged wolf, he says, did the crow have three eyes? And I, I think that was in order to try and get, to verify Jojen's story, but it was a bit of a leading question. I think, <laughs> I think the better question would have been, describe the crow. <laughs> yeah. Or, did he, the crow, did the crow have four eyes? <laughs> no, Bran, the crow had three eyes. <laughs> Yeah, he uh, needs a little work on uh, on his <laughs> verifying questions there. <laughs> Courtroom brat. <laughs> <laughs> Objection, leading. <laughs> so the crow came to Jojen, he says, when he almost died of gray water fever, which I tried to look up to see if there was any useful background info on that, but there's not. This is you live in a swamp. Reference. You're going to get yeah. fevers, let's right. be honest. <laughs> You live in a swamp, uh, and there's no such thing as antibiotics. (laughs) Expect fever. Especially from gray water. Exactly. (laughs) It doesn't sound very healthy to consume in general. Uh, But So the crow came to uh, Jojen when he almost died of gray water fever as a child, and Bran mentions the crow came to me after my fall. So um, now we've only got two instances here, but in both instances... The, whatever force there is behind the three-eyed crow reached out to struggling kids through their dreams when kid had yeah, suffered a yeah. traumatic event. So, you know, at the moment, that's just anecdotal uh, coincidence, but maybe there is something going on there. But also high-born children as well. Oh, true. Yeah. So perhaps it, it picks and chooses its targets. Or perhaps... The low-born children who have near-death experiences and are saved by the third eye crow. No one listens to their dreams because they have to get back in the fields and pull the plow. <laughs> stop! <laughs> stop your blubbing. <laughs> Could be that too. That that's part of the anecdotal thing. We, yeah. <laughs> uh, but you remember in Brand Three that that of a Game of Thrones, the dream that he had um, when he when uh, Brand looked to the north and saw the heart of winter. And the crow said, now you see why you must survive. Now Jojen's saying the crow is north of the wall. So, you know, maybe he's assembling an army of dreamers to fight the others. The crow is? Uh, possibly. I, right. I, I wasn't sure if you meant Jojen. Oh, no, yeah, the crow the is. Crow, yeah. right. That's my yeah. possible inference from that is. Or, or it could be a trap, you know, leading these boys north of the wall under false pretenses. That could be. Something going on there too. Yeah, yeah. Because because in that same chapter, Bran saw the bones of thousands of other dreamers before him impaled on the rocks below. Right. Um, and now we start to see what possibly what that image may have meant that Bran's not the first with green dreams and crow or and or crow dreams that maybe these thousands of dreamers before that are on the rocks are the ones that couldn't fly, the ones that weren't able to fly and have green dreams like Jojen or what he's hoping, what the crow's hoping Bran will have here. Yeah. So Bran, of course, was hurt and disillusioned when he woke up still broken, unable to fly. Uh, But perhaps that's because Bran is interpreting the dream literally. And if he was, if he could see the dream less through Maester Lewin's eyes, he might see that the, chains are metaphorical and he could break them in other ways right which could go back to the being the product of his environment he's yeah, yeah exactly. he is yeah. heavily influenced by a man who takes the literal interpretation of life he's a man of science and so bran took that literally yeah. I, I should have been able to fly and i can't so Jojen says that um, the, he told his father, Howland Reed, of the winged wolf dream and uh, Reed Sr. immediately sent the children to Winterfell. So he obviously puts enough stock in Jojen's re- dreams to take them seriously. You know, that, that he wasn't just sending them to give fealty to the new 
prince of uh, the north, he wanted to warn Bran about what he'd seen, or... Right. Yeah. He put enough stock into his son's green dream to pack his kids up and uh, ship them to Winterfell. Yeah, and, and that goes, again, I think, backs up what you're saying about the the presence or absence of a maester. Without a, a, a maester here might have said, said, oh, and it's just a dream. He's a kid, you know? Right. I mean, sure, send them. Don't don't send them to describe his dreams. Nobody cares about other people's dreams. Let <laughs> me tell you. <laughs> oh, man. I wish Molly would learn that lesson. The amount of times <laughs> I have to sit through one of a retelling of one of her dreams, I'm like, whew. <laughs> Um, yes, you're right. The indulgence of the green dreams from the primary adult in his life without the balance from the maester's view would definitely have these kids leaning in the direction of spiritual magical view of the world because there's no scientific balance on the other side that you might get from a maester. Uh, but by the way, there's a, a lot of talk of of Jojen and Mira's father, Howlin, but no mention of their mother. Their mother's name is Gianna, J-Y-A-N-A, Gianna, I guess. Uh, but there's really not a lot of info about her other than that she's also from the neck. She's a, a Cranog woman, I guess. Right. So Jojen tells Bran to open his eyes. Bran says his eyes are open. Jones, Jojen says only two of them are, and Crow gave you the third eye, and we all know that that really did happen in the dream. So Jojen can definitely see into Bran's dreams. There's no doubt about it despite Bran leading him with the questions. Um, <laughs> and also, it cl- you know, to a certain extent, it clears up the mystery of what the third eye might do. Georgian said that you can see to the person's heart, you can see the future and the past, you can see the far-off lands, if you're able to open that third eye. Um, but we're not quite sure if Georgian has that ability. I mean, he has some of that ability, because he can see the future. Um, yes. Um, and Bran makes a comment or brand has a thought about jojen he says when jojen looks at you it's like he's seeing something else like something right. beyond just looking at you yeah, so yeah. we don't know if he's got the full capabilities of like green seer type level capabilities but it does seem like he, he certainly has some levels of the of these yeah. abilities now remember the crow had been trying to peck a third eye in Bran's head ever since the dream when he finally woke from his uh, coma, the one where he was falling and saw the, um, you know, saw in all various directions and and saw the dreamers below him. But he finally did so in the dream after Clay Sirwin mentioned Jamie when all the people were arriving, all the the other lords of the north were arriving for the harvest feast. Clay Sirwin mentioned Jamie just kind of in passing, and Bran got really yeah uh, freaked out about the whole thing. And then that night he dreamed, of a, in his dream, the crow pecked out both of his eyes and then pecked a third eye into his forehead. And it was from that third eye that Bran saw a golden man say, the things I do for love, and then pushed him out into the open air. Yeah. So, And Bran hasn't told anyone about remembering Jamie in the dream because he thinks that it might not be a true memory. He thinks it could just be a dream. You know, he's right. he's not convinced all his dreams are true in the same way that Jojen is. Um, and it's mature to consider that, you know, that it might not be a real memory. And right. we read the book. We know who pushed him out. But, uh... Right. <laughs> Bran's <laughs> off been so fortunate. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's very possible because the Lannisters were in Winterfell when Bran fell, and his whole life changed during the arrival of the Lannisters. His father went south, and then everything literally, figuratively went south from there on. And, um, you know, it, it could have been his mind combining these two life-changing events, the arrival of the Lannisters and him falling and everything falling apart in his life. So, but you, know, you it, feel like if he discussed this with Lewin, Lewin would say, "Well, you know, now you, the, it does make sense. You you never fell from the walls ever, and then you possibly. did the day that the Lannisters were here, and they were the only two people around because everyone else was out on a hunt." Feels like that might be true. Possibly, Cat certainly jumped to that conclusion. Yeah, yeah. When she when she woke up from her uh, after she defended Bran when the the 
cat's paw tried to come and uh, kill him with that valerian steel dagger she woke up and thought had to have been jamie that was involved because they weren't on that hunt with everyone else so, so Bran gets increasingly upset and perturbed by this conversation with Jojen, you know, especially when Jojen says, hey, you, you dreamed you were Summer the night of the Harvest Feast, and I felt you when I touched Summer, and then you fell, and asks him if he fell every, every does he fall every night in his dreams? And this begins to strike a chord. Of course, Bran can't move, but Summer starts to close in on uh, the two reeds because Bran's emotions are expressed through the wolf, exactly as Jojen is accusing him of. <laughs> So, <laughs> you're doing it right now <laughs> right this second <laughs> <laughs> yeah it it struck me as a little surprising that uh, you know we know that the story that Jojen is telling about the the encounter in the godswood was true we we read about it Bran dreamt about it so I'm surprised it isn't resonating more with Bran I kind of expected a nine-year-old to be less skeptical and more accepting of right. something this, like that. This is how I feel about this whole thing as well. It seems strange. And in actual fact, when we get to the comparison of the TV show, this conversation is much more rational in the TV show. Oh, okay. Bran's interested in what Jojen's got to say, you know, and he's... I mean, Jojen's demonstrated that he's got insight into Bran's dream. I would think that, that you would take the opportunity to discuss it. I mean, yeah, yeah, and it... It's not like he's never talked to anyone before about his wolf dreams. He's he's mentioned yeah. it to Lewin and Osha back in Brand One of A Clash of Kings. He's mentioned that he has these wolf dreams. And he seems very accepting and open to Osha's claims of magical things north of the wall. So I yeah, yeah. it just seemed like he'd be more He's nine years old. He's nine years old. I mean I haven't been nine for twenty something years now. <laughs> that's right 20 something years <laughs> yeah I, I wondered if it was maybe the way they approached it you know like uh, like how Jojen was like well yeah I'll tell you what bad is going to happen but first you need to open up to me and tell me everything about your wolf dreams but initially he seems involved in that he seems engaged in it and it's only when Jojen really presses him on uh, it's really when Jojen presses him on the inhabiting summer that's when he starts to get really sensitive true yes so right, yeah. maybe that's that's a part of it that he doesn't want to come out so uh as we said jojen says today's not gonna be the day i die but mira says get up that tree you know <laughs> it's not gonna be the, the day i die you die because i'm gonna save your ass right exactly <laughs> for the like 28th time yeah. uh, so after the reeds get treed and brand calls for hodor to to scare Get the wolves to leave them alone. Uh, the reeds kind of go off. Guys, uh, they've had enough of this interaction for the day. And so you know, Bran's kind of feeling a little bit guilty he, about the whole thing. He's, he keeps thinking, well, it wasn't me. It was Summer. I didn't do it. But yet he's feeling guilty about it because I guess deep down he must know that he had some uh, cause of it. And, and so he wants to go see Mr. Maester Lewin because, you know, Maester Lewin is one of his confidants and you know he gets there and, and Maester Lewin is, is they're they're talking about Jojen's green dreams and we get a lot of detail about the uh about children of the forest and green seers and werewoods and all their connection which we've discussed in the past so there's uh, really not a whole lot of new information we gain there but they do start talking about Maester Lewin's chain and Maester Lewin's chain is a kind of a tight choker which he has to kind of slide around his neck which is in in very uh different compared to Ma grand maester Pycelle's chains. I, I think within the confines of game of thrones you should always say stark contrast i i started to but i stopped myself <laughs> grand maester Pycelle's chains were described back in ned four of a game of thrones as two dozen chains that hang from his neck down to his breast, and they were a gem studded as well. So I'm picturing uh, Mr. T at this point. Yes, he's the Mr. T of Maesters, I guess. <laughs> so I just I thought uh, that was an interesting difference there. The fact that 
Lewin just has a, enough links to get around his neck. I guess, I guess that's how you determine whether you're, when you're ready to take your maester's vow. Once you get that link that get that connects around <laughs> your neck, Lewin had to breathe in really hard. <laughs> Am I ready to be a maester? You got one choice, get another link or diet. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Lose a few pounds, you'll become a maester. Um, so after Bran leaves... Lewin, he sees Mira again and she tells him about Georgian's second dream. So the second dream is Bran is sitting at supper and Lewin, rather than the servants, bring him the food. Um, they bring to Bran the, uh, the best cut, the most uh, savoury, uh, rare looking cut, which smells delicious. Uh, but to the Frey boys, Lewin serves old grey dead meat. But they like their supper better than Bran does. So I... This is the bit. This is the moment where I started to think that your whole idea here—that it's, it's, the embracing of science prevents you from understanding and embracing magic—is the true meaning of this whole chapter. Because I think that's what this is saying. This is saying that he's Lewin. What he serves up to the phrase is just a sort of like a formal education, and it's you know. It gets them through. They learn their numbers. They learn how to write. You know, they 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 learn the things that you need. He takes Lewin takes more time with Bran and actually sort of like really engages Bran with discussions and they have sort of like a more um, uh, in depth conversations about his education. But it still leaves Bran wanting because Bran isn't satisfied. Bran, in some ways, feels there's more to the world. Okay. Yeah. That's a. I like that. That's a very deep interpretation of this dream. I was figuring it might be an event that hasn't happened yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I like your uh, your. It could be both. You know, the symbolism yeah, yeah, yeah. could yeah, be yeah. what you explained, yeah. and the reality could be maybe it's an event that hasn't happened yet. Because yeah. there's nothing in this dream that like fits with something that's already happened. Right, 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 right. Because he says, I don't, Bran says, I don't know what that means, basically. And Mira says, Jojen says, you will. And when you do, come talk to us again. Right, So, right. Anyway. Uh, dinner comes that night and it's pigeon pie for everybody. Everyone seems to get the same cut. So Bran discounts <laughs> the dream because it isn't literally coming true there and then. He's uh, like, whew, goodness. Yeah. Maester Lewin must be right then. <laughs> exactly, and that makes him think Maester Lewin's right. Nothing bad is going to happen at Winterfell. So, uh... and, and is that line right there when he thinks nothing bad is going to happen, nothing bad is coming to Winterfell, Maester Lewin has a right of it. That was when I thought, okay, that's a possible reason for why he was so resistant to believe Jojen and so quick to believe Osha about other magical things north of the Wall because a, a part of him... Is was fearing that Jojen is right and something bad is coming to Winterfell, which we know the Ironborn at least plan on coming yeah. attacking Winterfell, and so he was from the very uh, um, from that very onset of hearing that information was hesitant to want to believe that anything else Jojen said was true. It's a very good point. All right, do you got some background for us? I have a little bit of background. Background was tricky in this this chapter because like i said we've already talked about most of the things that were mentioned regarding uh eventually we'll have covered the whole of right. <laughs> world, world of, of ice, ice and fire, fire and fire yeah. and blood yeah. <laughs> so what I, I i focused a little bit on the discussion of uh lewin's maester's chain and so a maester's chain can be made of links from every metal known to man and once they've forged their chain Maesters never take it off, even when sleeping. Although, the description of Grand Maester Pycelle when Tyrion caught him in bed with the serving girl made no mention of his copious chains. So, uh, my, that's, I guess that's the least of the transgressions uh, against his vow that he was making at that particular <laughs> time. <laughs> uh, and, and it's also possible for, a citad for the Citadel to strip a maester of his chains. And if they knew what Pycelle was up to, they may have uh, just considered doing so. Mm -hmm. But according to George Martin, maesters can earn multiple links for the same subject, which signifies a maester's expertise in that subject. Okay, so 
here's a list of known link metals and what they stand for. We don't necessarily know if this is a complete list, but here's the ones that have been referenced so far in the story. So as we learned in this chapter, black iron is for ravenry. Valerian steel, as again we learned in this chapter, is for the higher mysteries. And uh, we also, both in this chapter and I, I mentioned it in the Tyrion 4 episode, uh, yellow gold is for math and economics and silver is for medicine and healing. Platinum, Tyrion noticed that Pycelle was, had a lot of platinum, had a lot of the more expensive uh, right. links in his chains. Um, we don't know what that's for, but it exists, we know, because Tyrion saw it. Bronze is a bit of a mystery because there's a lot of uh, references that, that don't exactly line up with one another. Bronze is either for astronomy, astrology, or possibly history. There's references that could indicate any of that. However, in A Feast for Crow's Appendix, it mentions that copper is for history. So I don't think bronze is for history. I'm guessing it's an astronomy, astrology thing. Oh. You know, um, my wife frequently calls my hobby astrology just to annoy me. <laughs> <laughs> it's astronomy. Exactly. Uh, iron is for Warcraft, which I guess makes some level of sense. Uh, then there are several that we don't know anything about, such as brass, electrum, lead, pewter, red gold, steel, and tin are all have all been mentioned, but not what they what they're signify a knowledge of um i would, th I would so, think that tin is quite a soft metal right i think tin would give you a little bit of so maybe tin is for easy breathing you know <laughs> true <laughs> that, you put that one right under your windpipe right, there. Exactly. <laughs> so more flexible all right comparison with the television show uh the reeds don't show up in the tv show for quite a long time so they're, they're like where where we basically are in the tv show the reeds aren't there um but when they do show up george does question Bran about his dreams, but the conversation is much more mature and calm. Uh, okay. Bran actually picks Jojen's brain for intel about his dream, which is sort of like more like what you'd hope would have happened here. But the scene with Maester Lewin is very much captured. Uh, Lewin wakes Bran up, and one morning, and Bran describes his dream, and they talk about dreams and how if they mean anything. Um, but of course, it's not presaged by any kind of conversation about George and Reed because he hasn't met him yet. Um, right. Rather, Bran's describing his wolf dreams to Lewin, and Bran says that um, Bran talks about the fact that he, his dream he really feels like he is summer, and Bran says that old Nan told stories of people who could live inside of animals. Lewin dismisses them as stories. Says, you know, hey, for every dream that you've had that seems real, you've had a thousand that never came true. So you know, it's right. just coincidence. Um, to pedantry. Um, you got some. I pedantry? just discovered. Is, is that yours or mine? I think that that's you your wording. It. You no, you I wrote, wrote it. it. Yeah. Huh. You didn't write that. I didn't remember writing anything down, but I had the same thought. I. <laughs> well, so, I I added the last little bit to it. Oh, okay. That's you. It was your. You were the one who noticed the pedantry. Uh, it was the unobtainium that I was like. I didn't write that, so I thought maybe <laughs> you wrote it. Uh, so. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what the enrollment is at the Citadel, what enrollment numbers are like. But uh, Lewin says he got no more efforts regarding ha having success with magic than the thousand boys before him and a thousand boys since. And I don't think I don't think the math works unless there are way more students Unless the, unless Citadel. the Citadel grows exponentially, a la coronavirus, you know. <laughs> right. I, even, we don't exactly know how old Maester Lewin is, nor do we know how old he was when he got, when he took his Maester's Vow and got his chain, or at least got his uh, Valerian Steel link. Maybe that was the first thing he did when he got there, yeah. is get his Valerian Steel link, and it has given him more years. Honestly, I, I if I if I was in Maester One Hundred One at the Citadel, I would say first of all go straight for the Valyrian steel. 
A, it's expensive. B, you can't fail that class. They expect you not to do anything. <laughs> no one can pass that class. Exactly. So. <laughs> you just get it automatically. <laughs> right, you got one. You one tried down. to raise the dead, completely failed. Here's your link. <laughs> <laughs> that's, just, that's good stuff, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, even if Maester Lewin was 60 and he got his chain, he, he took got that link at 20, which is pretty early for most uh, Maesters. Even those 40 years, there it would have to have an enrollment of 2,500 students a year to get to a thousand. Oh, the reason why is because we, we didn't mention this. <laughs> We've been talking about this, but we haven't mentioned what the issue is. He says only one in a hundred students st- take the Valerian Steel uh, training course, I guess you'd call it, to learn about magic or higher learning type things. So... You would need like twenty five hundred students every year in to get a enrollment. thousand in the Valyrian Steel class. Yeah, yeah, it's I, in I, the time that <laughs> I take your point. I I will say I think you're being unbelievably pedantic because he just <laughs> said a thousand boys before me, and a thousand boys since. He didn't mean I've counted them all. It's been exactly one thousand boys, <laughs> right? And plus, yes. he, I don't think he's only limiting it to. Um, to maesters either if you think about it um two little boys who get together and try to make a love potion to get the pretty girl to fall in love with them you know they're (laughs) also trying their hand at magic you know yes i was being i I was intentionally being very pedantic then you know in my um in my first year at university what you would call freshman year uh, me and my housemates decided to do some experiments on uh, extrasensory perception ah okay Uh, uh, and we uh we tried to do it by calling coin tosses. That was our that was our test. Was calling a coin toss. So the coin was tossed. You had to call it. And right. we did. We decided we would just do it twelve times, twelve coin tosses, and see how many could, you know we could get right. And we got. Would you believe twelve out of twelve? And we never did any more tests. We said that's <laughs> so... it. We we called it twelve times in a row. The odds are four thousand to one against doing. Wow. It. And we so were like, you guys, <laughs> we've proved it. And we, <laughs> we went you've to the got, pub. You've got the green site. Exactly. <laughs> so I think we were one of the thousand. That, that yeah, I, yes, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I, I, this was mostly, oh, of course, I was just joking about all that. But I did find it funny that I was like, a thousand cents? How old is this guy? <laughs> News and notes. Well, Th- this one is across... fascinating. This is fascinating. Yeah. I got to say. I came across this study. And uh, I came across it a week or so ago, and I've been holding it for this episode because it fits very well with this episode. So a recent study was done at Duke University and published in a journal called Current Biology that compared dogs and wolves in regards to being pets. It found, shockingly, that dogs make better pets than wolves. Who could have seen that coming? Uh, The primary reason is that dogs pick up cues from humans that wolves just don't seem to. Even wolves who have been hand-reared from pups by humans don't seem to put much nostalgic stock into those, said, humans. The, the a quote from one of the researchers said, We find that dog puppies are more attracted to humans, read human gestures more skillfully, and make more eye contact with humans than wolf puppies do. Uh, and the reason is believed to be that through the centuries of domestication, Dogs develop the ability to communicate with humans from an early age to infer what we're thinking and feeling, basically. And according to the researchers, that's something even our closest animal relatives, the chimpanzee, can't do. Uh, And the study was the largest quantitative comparison ever done regarding the cognition of wolves and dogs. Right, because because although we're closer to chimpanzees genetically, we've never coexisted with them the way we coexist with dogs. So the right. chimpanzees haven't learned over generations to understand our feelings, but the dogs yes. have. Yes. Sure. Yeah. 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 I thought that study, I, I came across it and I was like, huh, this fits really well with this chapter coming up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. We got a, a review on Apple podcast by John Pack NW. Uh, 
the best kind of podcast for a book series. I could and do echo all the other five-star reviews on here, but I urge any diehard or casual or Song of Ice and Fire fan to give this podcast a try. Simon and McKelly managed to discuss chapters thoughtfully while keeping it casual and approachable. Even Pedantry Corner, a segment that could have been obnoxious, is done in such a humorous, affectionate way that it's one of my favourite parts of every episode. Highly recommended for fans and first-time readers. Uh, yeah, I guess now I think about it, Pedantry Corner could come across as obnoxious, but it, it, yes. was, al- it was always intended to be fun. So. Yes. Thank you, I... John Pack NW. That's a nice one. Yes. Thank you, John. That was a fantastic review. When I read it, it brought a smile to my face. Yeah. I was uh, very Me happy too. to see it. And yes, I was completely joking about the thousand uh, <laughs> boys since <laughs> i mean you are allowed to be pedantic in pedantry corner i mean that's the point you know yes I- if not but... there then where? <laughs> <laughs> all right let's draw this to a conclusion uh i think uh the tv show has the right of it instead of fighting joe jim brand should be learning from him should be leaning on him now as i said that that scene is pushed quite a bit later in the whole narrative arc and brand is a little bit older when he talks oh, to Jojen. So he perhaps okay. has matured a little bit by that point. Sure, yeah. Water has passed under the bridge. Right. We do know that Jojen's right about the Bran summer dream in the Godswood, and we know the Ironborn are supposedly heading toward Winterfell here. So um, he does seem to have at least... Um, he's on to something here. Yeah. So, you know, should Bran and Rickon flee and protect the Stark line, or do they remain as the Stark or Starks in Winterfell? That's the yeah, I, question, I, I guess. I have to say, I, I do think Winterfell is defensible against the Ironborn, but we'll see. I mean, with winter coming, it's a, it's a tough nut to crack, Winterfell. Yes, for, you're for right. A, for yes. a group that just lacks the one thing you really need to... Uh, you know, to besiege a castle, which is numbers. You need numbers to make that right. siege watertight. We'll yes. see. How long, how long into the winter before uh, the Ironborn are just like, you know what, what do we yeah, need yeah. this for anyway? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's not worth it. Um, so will Bran ever be able to truly open that third eye, especially with Lewin as his mentor? Yeah. So he's definitely Lewin is a strong influence over Bran. So, you know, Bran right now is kind of being pulled in opposite directions from the Reeds and Lewin. And, you know, he's known Lewin his whole life. And Lewin, he's accustomed to Lewin being his educator, his advisor, his mentor. So uh, there's a lot of years of uh, of following Lewin's guidance versus just having met the Reeds. Yeah. And, and, and Lewin... Lewin cares for Bran. It's not like Lewin is trying to hurt Bran. You know, he right. cares for him. Yes. And everything he's doing is teaching him what he knows. But perhaps he has a blind spot to something that Bran needs to know. Yeah. Yeah. And we learn at the end of the chapter that Bran really was hoping that there might be something, some truth to magic and supernatural things because it means there's a possibility of him being whole again. Yeah. But because he trusts, respects, and loves Lewin, and he tells him straight up that there is no magic left, then, you know, that's... It's it's hard to... I, I mean, it's hard for a kid to shake a belief, even if you get that kind of information from someone you trust. But at the same time, it's also hard to hold on to that belief in the face of that from someone you love and trust, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah. Definitely goes back to the whole being pulled in two opposite directions thing here. Yeah. Well, but it's it's... Definitely a bad time for Sir Roderick to have ridden east to settle the issue with the Bolton Bastard and Danella Hornwood. Yeah. Uh, there may be sinister machinations here, but I just think that this boy is completely impulsive and he saw an opportunity and he jumped on it with very little plan of action. Yeah, that's that makes the most sense as to what happened. But, you know, I, I still... Uh, I still throw out that theory that could it be part of a larger plan. We do know back in Cat 8 of A Game of Thrones when she met up with Rob at Moat Kalen, she mentioned that Roose is cunning. So yeah, you know, maybe yeah. this is some of, some of his cunningness. Yeah. But it is a good break for the Greyjoys. I mean, 
as we've mentioned, they have quite the uphill battle to take right. over the North like they plan to do. So they no doubt need such breaks to pull off such a, an aggressive plan. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, as always, you can reach us at ghost.harrenhall at gmail.com and you can follow us on Twitter at Ghost Harrenhall. We're on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Discord. And if you would please go out and leave us a five-star rate and or a fantastic review, we certainly would appreciate that. And if you do, we just might read it out on a future episode. We certainly will. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye.